Nitty, you say that this is n not new, that the concern about the potential harm that can come from tinkering with the genetic code is really not new. And you say that people are sort of predispositioned to have a negative view of it because of, of our history in this country. Take us through that and tell us why this is either the same or different. So uh, I'll start by saying I think the techniques of today are very different than what I'm about to talk about. But if we go back in history uh, to the late 1800s and the early 1900s, we have something called the American Eugenics Movement. And the American Eugenics Movement started with some scientists who were not terribly unlike our prominent scientists who are here with us today who are incredibly well-intentioned but who at the time really misunderstood the science. Starting with some really basic concepts of genetics, which some of you may have learned early in genetics classes, like Mendelian genetics, so the idea that traits are simply, you know, that there's two characteristics of a trait or two alleles for a trait, and you inherit them just that simply, and every trait from eye color to everything else just has two little alleles, except traits are incredibly complex. And they thought, you know what, if this is true, if we have this kind of concept of heredity, then we should be able to breed much better populations. Uh, and we can do th so through selective breeding by trying to encourage people who have what we think of as preferential traits to have children together. And we can, by doing doing so get rid of some really undesirable traits, such as, and the ones they were really focused on were things like criminality, as if that's just one trait, um, or epilepsy, uh, or imbecility. That was a really popular one, which is we just had to get rid of these imbeciles. And you can see this kind of um, you know, progression here, which is different characterizations of imbecility that we just had to get rid of. And you might think this sounds crazy, and it does to us today, which is one of the safeguards we have against the kind of eugenic policies that we might go down. But um, as you'll see in some of the slides that now follow this one, there's a lot uh, of things that were incorporated into this. So what happened is a lot of states started having better baby competitions where people would actually then have photographs of the multiple generations, which they measured by things like height um, or uh, color of skin or color of hair. And it was used and incorporated to try to combat things like immigration policies, because people believe that immigrant populations were bringing bad traits into the population, or to try to increase the amount of sort of intelligence that they thought we might have in the population and to decrease some of the more uh, problematic traits. But at the same time, we had a lot of mental institutions. Um, and mental institutions across the country uh, were used for every different kind of person. So things like criminals, to things like um, feeble-minded people, to people who we thought were insane. I mean, this was the solution to a lot of different problems in society, was just institutionalized people. Over time, in the early 1900s, some of the states started having problems where uh, it started to become a little bit unfavorable to do this. So Virginia had a good idea. Virginia thought, we're going to pass one of these statutes, and the first person that we are going to ultimately sterilize is going to be a person who comes from a family of feeble-minded individuals. And in the case of Buck v. Bell, what happened was Carrie Buck's mother was already institutionalized and had been deemed an imbecile. Now, mind you, they didn't query what kind of education she'd received. This must have had a hereditary component. This is Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was her 18-year-old daughter, 17 here in the picture, um, who uh, was also deemed to be an imbecile because she could only read at an eighth grade level when she was 17 years old. And she had had a daughter, Vivian, um, out of wedlock, and this was before she was institutionalized. The assessment to Vivian was she must be an imbecile as well. So Carrie was going to be the first person that Virginia was going to sterilize. And um, it turned out that Carrie was represented by an attorney who tried to actually prevent her from being sterilized and argued that she wasn't such an imbecile after all and that she had rights under the U.S. Constitution, in particular that it was cruel and unusual punishment to sterilize her and that it would violate her due process of law. And the United States Supreme Court receives this case looks at all of the evidence before them, that is that Carrie Buck's mother is an imbecile, that Carrie is an imbecile, that Vivian is apparently an imbecile because she doesn't look quite right. And Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's one of our most famous jurists, who has penned some of the most famous opinions uh, that stand to this day, wrote in a very important opinion that it was okay to go ahead and sterilize Carrie Buck. And the reason it was okay was because three generations of imbeciles is enough. Right around this time, 
early 1900s, getting closer to World War II, Germany had also started adopting these broad eugenic policies. Mein Kampf, written by Hitler, adopts a lot of the language of the American eugenics movement, and there was a lot of cross-dialogue between American eugenicists and Germans. As we see what the progression of that policy was in Nazi Germany, the eugenicists in this country, that word eugenics was not a terrible word as it is now. It was actually a mainstream and good word. It simply meant better babies and better health. As that became incorporated into Nazi Germany and people saw the horrors to which that could be taken, they distanced themselves from the policies of eugenics. And we now have this horrible specter of eugenics that colors the entire field. So it's impossible to have this conversation without people immediately going there and assuming what's going to happen if we do something like mitochondrial transfer is the next step is massive sterilization of everyone or massive eugenic policies of just trying to have blonde hair and blue-eyed kids. I don't think we'll go there. I think we've learned a lot from the history and the science is quite different.